viewing any videos in this series is strictly voluntary. Welcome back. If you haven't yet seen last week's video, I would encourage you to start there. We, we uh, start with an overview about what it means to be whole or to be a person of integrity or balance. And I think it's important that we are on the same sheet of music. And I ended last week's video with uh, introducing this week's, and that is going to be on love itself. And indeed, what's love got to do with it? Isn't it enough to simply believe something about God or to be people of action in doing our best or to have good feelings toward others or to be in, in pleasant relationships that um, we could define as being a good uh, citizen of the world? What has love got to do with it? Well, let's ask that question and take a look at some specifics from God's Word. First, we're going to define love by taking pleasure in an exclusive object of affection. There are lots of ways to define love. We say that we love ice cream and we love a baseball team and we love that movie. Uh, the word love is used so often it really doesn't mean much. But to say that we have an exclusive affection, that we're uh, these things might be good but they're not the best, and that we are going to be devoted to that thing. Uh, and there are some people who we can say, and we do say, that they're religious about their uh, football, that they watch it, they read about it, they talk about it, they have jerseys, and they memorize the stats, and know the team's name, and the history. They are truly devoted to that object of worship, or that object of affection. Well, that's the way we're defining love, is an exclusive uh, devotion to an object of affection, something that we feel about uh, so strongly that we give our lives to this person or thing. And the Lord says that should be him. Here are the four most common words for love in the New Testament times. Eros, uh, from which we get our term erotic, uh, is primarily a sexual attraction. That's not in uh, the New Testament. Certainly there's uh, sex in the New Testament and the Old Testament as well. But the specific word for eros is not there. But it's important for me to bring it up because uh, sometimes we elevate the experience or the intensity of sexual attraction to say that that is the highest form of love. That uh, somehow when those feelings change or that intensity changes in marriage for somebody in their 60s or 70s or um, if, it, if it's not uh, the same as it was, that they have fallen out of love. And that is a type of love, but it's not the highest form if it were then our hope would be gone as our bodies start to change and we're no longer able to have sex. Another word is storge, which is a natural affection, for example, for a baby or even a pet. It's an affection for something or someone who is weak and we find attractive, but because of the nature of our relationship to them as a parent to a child or a owner to a pet or someone of great ability to give and somebody who is very needy, there is a natural, natural attraction to care for that uh, person because they are in a, a situation that needs love. That is focused on the other person's neediness or the, that thing's neediness. And we might say that we love them, but we certainly wouldn't want to derive hope from them, even though there are people who have children because they believe that that child will give them a sense of hope and purpose and love. So they're looking to their child to love them. What an incredible burden on a child and what a hopeless situation that an adult would look for that uh, child to bring them meaning and joy when eventually they'll grow up and move away. And then what is the hope of that adult? Phileo or phileo, depending on how you uh, pronounce it, is a mutual enjoyment among friends. Philadelphia, for example, is a city of love among brothers or brotherly love. Uh, uh, Philip is the love and Delphi is brother. So that is a type of love as well, but it's more of a friendship and it's not an intense devotion. Agape, however, is a devotion to another. It's sacrificing for that person's joy and blessing. And this is the type of love that God describes uh, as having for us that he's told us to have for him and even for others uh, for whom or to whom we are committed. It may help for us to distinguish between love as a treasure of gold 
versus a treasure of mean. Worship is treasuring God as the highest goal of our devotion. Listen to this passage from Isaiah. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and righteousness, and he will be the stability of your times, abundance of salvation, wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. And there, when he's talking about fear, that word can be synonymously translated with devotion or worship or service. Uh, it depends on how uh, it's used in the context. It's not a fear that draws away, but it's a fear that draws a person to the Lord because of such awe and respect and, and affection that we cannot do without him. Because the Lord is a source of everything good, because he is everything good. Similarly, we see in Matthew chapter 13, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes out and sells all that he has and buys that field. When we truly see and know that God is our highest goal of good, or the greatest treasure that could be, then we are willing to sacrifice or sell or do away with this in order to have more of him that we spend less, uh, less wasted time doing this so we can spend more time with the things that he says is good, that we stop um, indulging in these behaviors and practice that these behaviors that he says will bring us closer to him and experience more blessing from him. We're trading in, if you will, or selling or sacrificing things that we formerly esteemed as good to now esteem God as the highest good as he has revealed himself and proven himself wonderful in his, son, in his son, Jesus Christ. Sin, on the other hand, is treasuring anything as a mere means for our pleasure, which is really self-worship. You can flip back to that previous slide and look at the contrast. One is the highest goal of our devotion, and the other is a mere means to our pleasure. If that's what we mean by love and treasure, then we will trade in anything for whatever is immediately uh, pleasing to us. That could be different relationships, changing jobs, uh, turning to um, addictions to food or alcohol or binging on video games or anything else that we might name as long as it's a means to bring us pleasure. But listen to what the Lord says in Matthew chapter 6. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The reason that God calls us to delight in him, bottom line, and he doesn't, he doesn't want us to be broken hearted and in investing in things that are going to be rust and dust one day, because they're not just second best, they're temporary created, created things that are meant to point us back to the one who gave them. So if you love your wife, give thanks to God for the wonderful person that she is. If you enjoy um, a pizza or a movie or the smell of a flower or the strength of a mountain, give praise to God who has created all those things so that those things point you back to him in delight and not focusing on that thing that's going to bring you a temporary pleasure and then it's gone. That's why Paul tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that those who oppose the good news of Christ imagine that godliness is a means to gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of this world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. He's saying that if we focus on the things here, whether it's the uh, riches of actual gold and, and money, or thinking that our reputation, or our work, or our good looks <laughs> are going to last, it's a joke. Uh, our bodies will decay. Somebody else will inherit our riches. What we do in our jobs will be forgotten in 50 years, except in a few rare occasions. And even those people must answer to God that they invest in this life 
or did they devote themselves to him? Because you can devote yourself to him and still enjoy things in this life and do great things, but we do it so that we please him and experience more of the goodness of who he is. For whoever and whatever we treasure reveals who we are and our destiny. Listen to Romans 8. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God's plan for us when we follow him and love him is to be brought into relationship with him, to be made more like him, to be blessed by him, and all this comes through trusting in Jesus and following him. However, we read in Psalm 115, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they don't speak. Eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but don't hear. Noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel. Feet, but they do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. So whatever is our treasure, we will become like that. If it's God who is ultimate in strength and beauty and kindness and forgiveness and holiness, when we love him, he makes us more like him. If it's like our car or our job, then those will be as disappointing and uh, fallible and finite and uh, limited and warped as this world is, all of those weaknesses will become our weaknesses too. Because whatever we deem as greatest, we are necessarily under those things and submit to those things. And anything in this world will necessarily disappoint us. So the Lord calls us to turn from fool's gold and to turn to solid gold. Listen to Jeremiah chapter 2. Has a nation ever changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. The Lord there is described as the fountain of goodness, very life itself, not just the, the beginning of our existence, but every good thing that we need. And a cistern is a well. It's, it's um, something that held water. And he says, we've rejected him, the fountain of living water, and we've dug a hole in the ground that won't even hold water. It doesn't make any sense. Yet the Lord says, that is our tendency to do, because the very first sin was to want independence from God. Lord, let me run my own life. Let me decide what is true and good. And so he's given us over to that desire. But he's made a way back through his son Jesus, who can forgive our rebellion, and his Holy Spirit, who can change our hearts to again see and embrace that God himself is good. And he's given every good thing to point us back to delighting in him. Listen to Lamentations chapter 4. How the gold has become dim. How the pure gold is changed. The holy stones lie scattered at the head of every street. The precious sons of God worth their weight in fine gold. How they are regarded as earthen pots. The work of a potter's hands. That's a reflection of what our lives become like when we trust in the things of this world instead of devoting and delighting ourselves and God himself. Hope that's making some sense. Tune in next week and we will start to look at what does it mean to say that we love God? Who is God? What is so lovable about him? Because it's not just enough to say that we are to love God with our whole being and love each other. We need to be specific about that because many religions of the world talk about God. But Jesus talked about God in a very specific sense. And next week we will look at who that God is and how he is so good. Hope to see you then.